Next, we have Alexander Belser. He will be talking about a queer critique of the psychedelic mystical. Alexander Bessler is a, look this way, is a clinical research fellow at Yale University where he works to develop affirmative psychotherapies for LGBTQ people. His research with sexual minority people has focused on preventing suicide among adolescents and on the protective role of gay straight alliances for students. He was a founding member of the Psychedelic Research Group at NYU in 2006 and is currently an adjunct faculty member at NYU's master's program in counseling. He has been involved in a number of different psychedelic studies and also serves as a study therapist for the, M for the MAPS study of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. He serves as a peer-reviewed so peer reviewer for the Journal of Psychopharmacology and has published peer-reviewed articles on many topics on psilocybin-assisted psychotherapies. Let's welcome Alexander Belser. What a beautiful queer hall of crazy people. Uh, do I see some troublemakers out there in the back? Yeah, uh, some, some psychedelic nerds scattered around. Um, so I know we're kind of in the uh, seventh inning stretch of the day. If I invite you all, I'm gonna be talking about queer, spiritual, mystical experience and that acknowledges our bodies, that acknowledges our deep relationships with one another. If I invite you all to stand up, take a deep breath and say hello to a neighbor for a moment, can we like come back in a minute from that? Is that possible? So please rise and say hi to your queer friends on left, right, and behind. Okay, I'll give you guys another little moment to say thank you. So, uh, so maybe you found your dinner companions for the night or your snack partners for tomorrow or your coffee mates in the morning. Uh, so my name's Alex, my radical fairy name is Sasha. I am delighted to be here. My pronouns are he and him, but I refer, answer to they and the fairy she, as we sometimes call it. Uh, and I am delighted to be here. I, I'm here for a few reasons. One, I've, uh, how many people in the audience have been to a former, well, first of all, who for, for the people here is this your first psychedelic conference? Look around. That's a huge number of people. How many people here have been to one of the previous uh, psychedelic science conferences? All right. Has anyone, did anyone go to, so I, at my first conference, my first Mind States conference was in 2001, but in 2010, 
I started like surreptitiously passing out little queer flyers with like the lambda sign and the rainbow flag on them, asking people to join an LGBTQIA meet and greet in the garden. And um, it got some strange looks because people were like, well, but I was like, let's bring the queer folks together. So we, we hosted that in 2010, we hosted that in 2014, we hosted that again in 2017. And now we have an entire conference of queer people and allies coming together to talk about some of these issues. So it's, uh, Bia and Alex have done such tremendous, tremendous work making that happen. Um, uh, I'm also here because uh, as a trained counseling clinical psychologist, I, um, my, my research and dissertation research is on preventing gay suicide among LGB kids, So, I, and a lot of my clinical practice is worth gay, uh, queer, bi, trans youth. Um, and in my other world, I do psychedelic research with psilocybin at NYU and in a couple studies at Yale, uh, and I, I get to be a study therapist in the MAP study uh, to treat people with uh, severe PTSD with MDMA. Uh, and we have this amazing group of clinicians in New York that it feels like a bit of a home for me. Today, um, I get to mix in a little bit of power and a call to action. So I'm going to start with the conclusion, and we're going to move towards the last bit of it, which is like a, a tr an arc line towards what it means to have a mystical experience, which is like a dominant narrative in the psychedelic Academy, and so I'm a bit of an academic, forgive me if I get a little too like methodological at times, um, but I'm gonna mix in some of like the political piece. Like queer spirituality is about power. It's born out of the plague years, uh, at least a huge strand of it is. We're approaching the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, and I feel like a sort of power analysis and discourse is important here. So I, uh, I invite the strong queer, not only survivors, but victors, and each of you to like come forward and take whatever you gather from each other uh, forward with you as, after you leave this conference, because I think that not only do our communities, our professional communities need this, but like queer kids, queer elders, like we all need this more than anything else at this time. So without ado, I'm going to give you uh, like my 10 calls to action. Number one, uh, confront structural heterosexism and transphobia at every level. And, and as an academic, like I, I, I'm going to be talking about the clinical psychedelic research explicitly. And what I mean by that is there are structural factors that are totally unacknowledged oftentimes. And I offer a loving critique of my friends who are often white, straight, cisgender, male researchers, but they tend to be the the PIs, the primary investigators in almost all the studies. They tend to be the funders of most of the studies. And, and unsurprisingly, the vast majority of our clients that come into these studies happen to be white and straight, right? So um, we have to look at every level at the ways in which heterosexism influences this. And that means talking about queerness in multiple different ways. And sometimes it makes people a little bit uncomfortable or it seems irrelevant. Um, Part of that is the lack of queer patient-centric approaches. So let's talk a little bit about what that means, right? Like when you're working in a room, some people are already familiar with this. So I'll try to re re recapitulate the argument. When you're working in a room with a client, right, and, and whether it's psilocybin therapy or MDMA therapy or what, what have you, there's this sort of uh, trope of the, the male and the female therapy dyad. And this is so, totalizing and essentializing and reducing of like traditional gender norm stereotypes that the man in the room as the therapist has masculine daddy energy, the woman has like feminine earthly swish like energy and like it's important for the, the, the client no matter their gender to have mommy and daddy in the room because God could appear to them as male or female. And I think that we need to move towards like a gender expressive gender neutral approach. In large measure due to my queer mentors, guides, like Bob Jesse's in the audience, my friend Joy, Wolfie, Wolfwoman are in the audience, like we've been like fighting this for a long time. My friend and uh, in many ways mentor Jeff Gus at NYU when we started the NYU group was like, you know, like we're not gonna have like a male, male, a male, female required diet. We're gonna have male and male therapists in the room. We're gonna have female and female therapists in the room. We're gonna have uh, invite trans and non-binary non people into the room. If a person has, if the client has a specific reason, like a history of sexual trauma with men that might preclude that person working with a two cisgender male therapists, then 
Acknowledge that in your preparatory and intake work with the client, but it does not have to be a firm and fast rule for every people. And in fact, I think it's a type of uh, violence done against uh, gender and our experiences of our own gender in the room. I will say the original MAPS introductory studies required a male-female therapist dyad pair. In the new phase three national study, in part due to some grumblings in specific acute conversations, uh, and a lot of good reflective action on MAPS, they no longer require that in the current MDMA therapy. So there's movement here, which is great. I work around sexual minority stress. So sexual minority stress, we see consistently that queer folks, like the people in this room, have much higher prevalence and incidence rates of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, panic attacks, problematic alcohol use, problematic like addictive substance use. And for many years, we thought that was because queer people were pathologized as sick. We now know consistently, the research consistently shows it's not because you're queer that you suffer a greater mental health burden. It's because we live in a heterosexual society that exposes you to specific sexual and gender minority stressors. These stressors have been shown to have elevate cortisol levels in the body. They engender ex profound experiences like from infancy through adolescence and into the workplace and into the legal structure of it, discrimination, bullying, victimization, um, constant concealment of one's sexual attraction and energy from one's very family, sisters, brothers, and peers. You have experiences of discrimination in the workplace. You have legal discrimination. And then those get transmuted into internal coping strategies where you have to, concealment of identity means you're constantly hypervigilant in the environment for menace and danger. As a gay boy growing up in Indiana, I, like, I couldn't go to the male locker room where I'm supposed to be in a safe space for boys not to have to look at girls, where I'm like literally fearing for my life because of potential experiences of being called names, degraded, slurs against queer folks, um, and the sort of homophobic attacks that so many people, like listen studies have shown, are exposed to every day in our nation's schools. The sexual minority stress causes disproportionate harm, and I think it's incumbent upon clinicians and people looking in the health, mental health world to think about that harm. That's not to say that we only need to look at psychedelics as a mental health remedy, but I think it's important, and that's what my background is, so I want to talk about the, like, the psychological aspects of this, to think about how to develop therapies for queer folks. So, I'm calling this LGBTQ affirming affirmative psychedelic assisted therapies, QA, PAP, QPAP. We can come up with a different acronym if you like, because no acronyms are going to do us any justice. But there are ways to do this, and here's how, right? First thing you do is we have to test if the current treatments even work. Anytime you offer a treatment to any target group, racial minority, ethnic minority, indigenous person, queer person, gender variant individual, you have to see does that you have to see this, does it work for whom, right? And because the research skews white, straight, cis, and male, uh, we consistently have to do at least, at the very least, ask the questions. Do you identify, like ask the questions, are you LGBTQ? Are you um, a trans individual? What are your pronouns? If you start asking those questions, you can at least, if you're a data nerd, run moderation analyses. So we have hundreds of people taking psilocybin in the United States as part of clinical trials. But almost none of those trials do we run moderation subgroup analyses to see, okay, it works across the whole. Does it work or does it work differently for the sexual and gender minority people? I don't know. I have no idea. And I'm a queer person who works with queer people all the time. We need to start measuring these things and, and attuning to these things. And it's getting a little bit better, but these things, these need to be part of the standard publication. When you publish a paper, you should be running subgroup analysis by race, ethnicity, and, sex and gender, and sexual identity. And then you can do meta-analyses to look if it actually works for those people, even if your sample size is quite small in any one given study. Otherwise, you're propagating heteronormative um, structures of oppression, frankly. Number five, let's come up with our own therapies. So, you know, when we talk about what is psychedelic therapy, what is psychedelic treatment, what is psychedelic assisted therapy, we should develop and test LGBTQ affirming psychedelic therapies. The, this is looking at like three different stages. Like first of all, you qualitative research. This should be of, by, for, and with LGBTQ people. So you interview dozens, scores of psychedelic ther uh, queer therapists. How many people in the room have some sort of therapy, clinical, training background where you see patients or clients? Okay, look around. 
We should just like have like a little like mixer afterward. I will start asking you questions like, what have you learned in your practice as a queer person working oftentimes, I imagine, with queer people? You do the qualitative research, you, you start to develop a new therapy that addresses specific sexual minority stressors that queer people are exposed to, specific types of trauma, specific types of discrimination, and how that affects them. So for like gay boys growing up like me, oftentimes that means we get to be the best little boy in the world. Horrible internal shame. But if we compensate by being smart and attractive and funny and nice and people pleasing all the time, we can suppress our internal shame and be validated externally by others, right? You see this through like high rates of social anxiety amongst queer people. Like, I'm afraid of getting attacked, so I globalize, like isolating at home, staying in, and not addressing conflict, not being assertive, not claiming my power in social spaces. So you need to address therapies that actually look at that. And psychedelics kick this material up. And I think it's unfair to our queer friends if we don't <laughs> actually take a look at whether or not we can develop a therapy moder uh, looking at that develop developments. You need to do the polyla trial, and then you should do the randomized controlled trial of taking the LGBTQ affirming psychedelic treatment versus the generic LGBTQ, uh, the generic psychedelic treatment. And I really think that there is potentially a space for an LGBT specific treatment. And even within that, there should be subtreatments by gender and by gender identity types and by other forms of uh, identity. Number six. Okay, I asked this question earlier, tongue in cheek, but. I think it's a really important question. Why aren't we assessing, when people go into a trial, what their attraction is, how they understand themselves, what the boundaries are around their selfhood, around sexual identity? I, I consistently, and I've worked with patients who go in as straight, they go in as cisgender, they don't have any awareness of anything else, and they come out of the treatment with a very different understanding of themselves. They change their gender identity, they change their sexual identity, I, uh, orientation terminology, they change the way they think, they begin experimenting, talking with their straight partners about these sorts of things. This is a research question, right? It does not have to be a figment of our imaginations. These are things that we can test pre and post. Okay, there are all sorts of measures in existence. What is, how do you identify now? Where do you identify down the road? It's not just the Kinsey scale, but we can you know, talk about that. And I think we can answer these questions, and I think it's actually a really important question because so many people, you know, we can think about the, the conceptual model, but the structures of oppression are so powerful externally, they become so transmuted internally to structures of internal oppression, and psychedelics oftentimes are ways of lim limerencing, liberating, opening that up, and I think it does change sexual and gender identity. I don't know why we're so afraid of sex, right? Like, the psychedelic, there's this narrative, the psychedelics get out of hand, okay. Psychedelics got out of hand, like we got to button it up this time, like no one's going to run off the rails and found the League of Spiritual Discovery. So I get to wear like a suit coat and a button down shirt uh, and you go to psychedelic conferences, we got the ties on, everyone's like no one's talking about their drug use. I get it. And I think actually it's profoundly subversive in some ways to do that sort of work. To, it, I think that there isn't a strong argument for that. And because of that, nobody talks about sex, nobody talks about the body, there hasn't been any attachment research in um, psychedelic assisted therapy work. And I think, it's, I think it's very strange. And I think the queer folks, we, because we've been forced to address our relationships with our body, our bodies, and our sexuality, our sexual power and desire, we actually have something to teach our straight peers. Okay, eight out of 10. Let's ally and get intersectional. Okay, so we need to address intersectional identities, race, class, ethnicity, um, indigenous status, immigration status, disability, incarceration, which I don't have on here, um, but ally with other target groups to dismantle, and I think this is important, both pre- and post-colonialist, patriarchal, homophobic, and transphobic structures. I, you know, like, I've, I'm familiar with um, many ayahuasca circles, many underground circles. I consistently hear anecdotal reports of friends and colleagues and friends of friends who have uh, profoundly rejecting experiences. 
I don't know how exactly to make sense of all of that, but you know, this sort of allyship like extends to, across different allyship genders and, and spaces. And I think that it's important to do that not just in the laboratory of the university, but in all the states, spaces that we find it. Um, this gets extremely naughty, and I, but, and, but I, I think that the way we do it is to get intersectional and to do it together. And I, I, I think that meetings like this are powerful in that way. Queer people are wise. Psychonauts can learn from them. I was at a Beltane gathering in Tennessee at a Radical Ferry um, gathering, and a, we were tying the ribbons of the Maypole around the Axis Mundi, around the Beltane Pole. And in that, we renew our intentions for the new year. What do we weave into the pole? Um, and someone I look up to in the circle stood up as part of the opening ritual and said, our magic is intersectional. We come from every walk, we come from every religion, we come from many families, from every path. And so we are by nature a convergence. Like queer folks are by definition plural. The people in this room did not all come from the same religious lineage. We came from scores of religious lineages. And in this way we learn from each other. Psychonauts, psychedelic users, psychedelic researchers, in many ways are the same way. Some of them come from like conservative Baptist homes who somehow dropped acid in college and like it changed their life. And so they come to psychedelic conferences and in much of the same way, there's a convergence of wisdom paths. So we constantly are frustrated by the thinness of our access to wisdom paths, but we have all of the tributaries are coming together in places like this. This is both a, a weakness, but also a powerful strength. We need to learn to access the queer wisdom that comes together because we have been exposed, I think oftentimes by virtue of our structure as psychedelic enthusiasts and researchers as queer folks to oftentimes various strands on the great tapestry that we call human civilization. And now my talk is about spiritual and mystical experience. Uh, the truth is that the mystical experience is already, I believe, very queer. Um, it is embodied, like I said at the beginning, it is relational, it is political about power, and it is visionary. Um, so let's talk about what that means and how to reclaim it from what I think is a fairly narrow understanding. Okay, those are my, my talks, okay. This is a black box. What is in that black box? I don't... <laughs> Schrodinger's cat is in some state of aliveness. Um, I. If you read the literature today, I want to ask you guys the question, like, how do psychedelics work? Right. So as, as a scientist, as a psychologist, like, we try to answer those questions with things like questionnaires and research methods and structural equation modeling and, like, measurement indications and all sorts of things like that. And the leading answer, in addition to sort of the neurobiological things, like it's anti-inflammatory, it's active at the 5-HT2A receptor sites, it has an effect on the serotonergic system, it's neurogenerative, all of that's great, but honestly, my take on it is that nobody really understands what is the causal mechanism factor there. But actually, when you look at the statistics and the leading argument, this is the mystical black box. People take psychedelics, they have, something happens, they have a mystical experience, which we measure, and then suddenly they get better. They have symptom reductions on anxiety, depression, all sorts of scores. And here we are as the observer, but we don't know what's in that box. It could be a box of cats. So <laughs> this is the mystical black box. And you know, this is the standard thing that you see in all of the publications. The person takes psilocybin. This is called the mediation, right? This is the mechanism of action. This is the pathway. They have the MEQ, which is the mystical experience questionnaire. And if they have a mystical experience according to this questionnaire, then they have improvements in their anxiety and depression. I'm going to make a series of critiques, and I wade into treacherous ground because when you talk about mysticism, it's... It's really a lot of fun. Um, so I'm making four loving critiques, a methodological critique, so allow me to get nerdy and like access your inner nerd, a theistic critique, I'm, what I'm calling it like a nature mystical critique for lack of a better word right now, and then a queer criticalist femini feminist critique. Uh, I will be offering evidence from my interviews with patients in our trials. So I've been interviewing 
patients we treated um, with psilocybin who had cancer and uh, existential distress and anxiety and depression. Uh, I'm also interviewing people in a religious professional study. Uh, these are healthy, normal people, but they're priests and clerics and Zen teachers and imams who are getting psilocybin and then talking to me at length about what they experience. Okay, is, is mysticism one or many? Um, I'm going to skip to the bottom quote by Zayner. We have been told ad nauseum that mysticism is the highest expression of religion and that it appears in all ages and all places as more or less identical form. But rarely is any attempt made to substantiate the assumption and rarely are the equally significant differences analyzed. So on one hand, we hear that mystics all over the world report basically the same experience. They have an attainment to a non-dual one, right? And the second is that there are great differences among the reports and possibly among the experiences. So which is it? You know, we see this in the psychedelic literature too. So like the vanguard of psychedelic research is Masters and Houston's research in the in 1960s. They treated 206 people with LSD and by their assessment message, a mere one in 20, 5%, of the people they treated reach what they called an authentic mystical state of the integral level. Well, that's kind of rare. But then if you look at Hopkins research, and I, I mean, more power to the work that they're doing there, but in their first groundbreaking study in 2006 on this topic, they said that six out of 10 people had a quote unquote complete mystical experience based upon a score on this particular measure, and that that was uh, indicative of multiple outcomes. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it's a pretty big difference here. So it seems like we may have to agree to disagree. Let's try to get into why. The MEQ is the dominant measure around mystical experience. It's based upon work by Stace um, in the 1960s, and it's been used in a variety of trials. And there is like a particular lineage, like Stace uh, informed Panky, Panky at, at Harvard, the sort of um, Marsh Chapel experience. Uh, Panky influenced and worked with Bill Richards, whom I adore, came to Hopkins, and the measure sort of gets handed down through time and then is disseminated to all the research studies. Uh, and if the measure works, then you keep using it, basically is how it goes, because it's a significant finding. Here's the critique, right? So you see the sort of pathway and you see that the MEQ is predictive. So what is the MEQ measure? If I were to ask you guys, how do you measure mysticism? Well, they, they have four factors. Is it mystical? Um, which, <laughs> I mean, literally, they call it the mystical subscale factor of the mystical experience questionnaire. But it, does it promote unity uh, and sacredness? The second factor is positive mood. The third factor is transcendence of time and space. And the third is ineffability. Here is um, uh, structural equation modeling of the mystical experience. I mean, we can discount that, but I actually think that this is really important work, and I think it's like it's difficult to understand, but, but, but they're basically trying to weight factors to try to understand what is predictive of outcome, and this is better than just like a sum scale. But when you look at the actual results from it, okay, if we were going to say, oh, this depressed person comes into a psilocybin trial, and they get better, how do we account for the improvement in score? And so you can look at all sorts of factors. It could be multi-causal, right? So for on the left, you see, or here on the right, you see the depression measure. So in this, in this study with psilocybin, you know, mystical experience did predict better depression uh, scores. People got better if they had a, a, a mystical experience by this measure. But it only explains 13% of the variability in the depression score by this particular measure, which means that 83% of what's in that black box is totally unknown, right? And that 13% could be highly correlated with other types of spiritual or religious experiences, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. So I think this measure is woefully incomplete. And when you look at a single pathway, you actually have to look at, imagine like a rainbow prism pathway or an intra web. There's multiple causal idiosyncrasies for people throughout this event. I'm going to talk about God for a minute. I know, I know. Um, Stace was a purist. Uh, he said that the genuine spiritual experience was non-sensuous, without qualities. It is formless, shapeless, colorless, odorless, soundless, and non-intellectual. It is not any sort of hocus-pocus or mystery-mongering, so the mystery cult people should go home. Um, 
And he did not honor or really acknowledge uh, these lesser states, what he called lesser states of the beginning or intermediate states that people had. Well, that seems incommensurate with my understanding of the psychedelic experiences people have. The MEQ builds on the work of Stace, and I think that this is problematic. It, it really privileges a type of monism, a mystical oneness, a monistic mysticism, the void or a type of, of um, experience like that. It's consistent with Aldous Huxley um, and perennial philosophy. Uh, it's consistent with Advaita and the Vedanta tradition, but it does not measure theistic encounters. So if you have a DMT trip and have an experience of an entity, or if you take uh, ayahuasca and have an experience of divine love and encounter with an angel or a god, or even in like a non psychedelic experience like the bhakti devotion of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, bodhisattva encounters, like the, the measure is like, mm, that's like lesser, sophomoric spiritual work. You actually have to get to a, non, a qualityless experience to have a non dual experience. People hear visions. People see, uh, people, they do hear visions and see voices. Um, and it doesn't, so it's really missing out on a lot of things. Um, this person said, and, and you know, she, she would have had a mystical experience probably just, but actually the questions don't address her experience. This is a cancer patient. At some point I just started feeling love. Just overcome with love and all the love I have for my family and my friends. It was something coming from them also. I felt that I was bathed in it and if I were religious. It definitely, it would have been a religious experience. I would have said bathed in God's love. I don't think English really has a way to say this without using the word God, maybe uh, bathed in transcendent love, bathed in universal love. It was such a strong feeling. For lack of a better term, I'm calling these nature mysticism. If we look at the work of Pablo Amaringo, color, light, entity, sound, ikaros. Um, so when you look at the, these sorts of experiences we see in the clinical lab and in, in the wisdom path of work coming out of Peru and uh, Brazil and other places, it's inconsistent with stasis criteria. The visions are highly sensuous and colorful. They have sound and form and shape. People have encounters um, with the three worlds, with ancestors and animal spirits. We see this even in people that don't have any sort of exposure to these in indigenous traditions coming into our lab on First Avenue in Manhattan, right? Um, we're looking at the importance of Ikros and music coming from Mendel Kalin's work on the importance of music as a moderator, moderator of that black box experience. And if you go back to the original reported speech uh, and work of Maria Sabina, her visions of the mushroom spirits are inconsistent with a the monistic theology. In our cancer trial, people saw things like a gorilla face, a horse's eye, two serpents, two colored cow heads. You know, they're not seeing like the one train or like the, the F train or anything like that. They, they had a vision of a blue placid lake with a boatman wearing a white hat on a sandy shore three-dimensional chess worlds, massive synesthesia experiences across the various matrices of the human senses. People met loved ones as guiding spirits. They had the Virgil Dante experience of psychopomps like dead relatives coming to them to guide them by the hand and help them navigate the psychedelic psilocybin moderate to high dose realm. This person said, I was flying through space with the spirit guide and I encountered three people who are dead who were very close to me. My dad's dad, my mom's mom, and my best friend in college who died, and they all gave me reassuring messages in space. From my friend Tim, I'm sorry for everything that has happened. I just wanted to know I love you, man. My grandfather gave me a hug and my grandmother kissed me on the cheek. That was powerful. I believe these are mediators of clinical symptom reductions. And we need to be measuring these things, but we are not currently in a formal way. So we're looking at a privileging, not just of like race and ethnicity and gender, but a privileging of a type of psychedelic spiritual experience of a monistic overtheism or nature mysticism. This is what Stace called borderline cases. Okay, so I'm gonna do my best with like a criticalist queer feminist critique. It's a little inchoate, but um, I'm sure you guys can like, join it with your own work. Um, 
you know, in the work of Evelyn Underhill, it's like this amazing Christian writer on Christian mystical experiences, like the female mysticism is strongly associated with voices and visionary experiences, with ecstasies like St. Teresa de Avila, who's like pierced by God in this like ecstatic, erotic, charged energy, creative expression, longing, devotion, love, friendship, and compassion. I mean, this this like sort of builds into the work of Carol Gilligan, who was my teacher at NYU, and, and her work on the stages of moral development, right, where women were consistently scoring lower on stages of moral development and she, until she realized that like an ethic of care, of relationship, of compassion was also like a type of universal ethic that should be as high as a sort of like male androcentric understanding of what constitutes like the highest form of moral practice. <clears throat> this phrase has been helpful to me, relational mysticism, which is the experiencing of the real in relationships with other people. Largely neglected in mystical scholarship, largely neglected, I think, in psychedelic scholarship. We look at the type of interbeing work where we see um, the Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, a black queer Zen teacher who said that my liberation is bound up with your liberation. Our, it, our beings are interdependent. And these love and compassion, spiritual friendship experiences are central to multiple mystical traditions and should be acknowledged and central to many queer traditions because we had in many circumstances to leave our families of origin and reconstitute our new families of loves and bonds of fellowship and affection with one another. And so in fact, we've become very good at it because we were often forced to. And then where's the attachment theory? I mean, you need to, you, like, there are clinical implications for practice around good touch and embrace, and I feel like there, there needs to be some serious scholarship and research done here um, to improve clinical practice. If we get a little queerer, you know, queer liberation like needs to move from a mainstreaming equality like movement toward like assimilationist politics towards a type of true liberation, a true liberation of the queer mind and body. I was born in 1980, um, and my journey as a gay boy and a queer man was largely shaped by the plague years, um, coming to age in a time when everybody used uh, condoms, um, because that was the only way to avoid seroconversion. And um, queer spirituality is political, it arose in particular political times. This is one iteration of it, um, but I think there is something in inherently powerful about that. Uh, Audre Lorde says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I'm wondering to the extent to which our queer um, technologies, our types of tools, I'm wondering to the extent to which our psychedelic technologies and practices and medicines could be seen as ways to dismantle structural depression. <laughs> uh, ego death, like, like a classic psychedelic idea, like requires sloughing off ideas of gender and basic identities. And, you know, to quote Harry Hay, we need to move from a subject-object orientation. It is strange for me as a queer fairy folk to be in a room where you're all, like, looking at me and I am not in a circle with you. Because the subject-object distinction is difficult. And I understand the need for lectures at times, but, um, how can I acknowledge your subjectivities in the room when you are not speaking and you are sitting and I am standing? This is powerful in psychedelic circles. This is powerful in individual work with our clients in, in the practice. It is not our job to liberate the oppressor, but can our queer sensibilities and our psychedelic work help to liberate the oppressor both without and within? Can we reembrace our queer spiritual play and playfulness? This is subversive. This is trickster energies. This is something that is powerful. And oftentimes, straight researchers in the psychedelic scene are so um, earnest, you know, like really, really earnest. And I love my friend Mary Cosimano at Hopkins because like, she's like, let's, let's dance. Like, will you help lead a chant with me? And she really subverts the space. So we don't own playfulness, but we get, we're pretty good at play, right? Yeah? You guys are okay at, at making a little play? Yeah. 
the body, sexual awakening. And finally, like multiplicity, not just pluralism, but true multiplicity. I, you know, people are like, oh, the highest level of non-dual experience is a total experience of unity and oneness. And I, I'm like, that's like one, I mean, okay, here's a critique. That's like one triad on the triangle of total oneness. But if you really want to achieve a non-dual experience, the other foundational little piece of that triangle is the multiplicity of all things. And to receive those wisdoms and to bring them together in a dialectical way that it surpasses my understanding, I, I wonder if that is part of the queer contribution to true mystical experience. This is a woman, um, oh, she was great. <laughs> she said, after her psilocybin experience, it was like being inside of nature. And I could have just stayed there forever. It was wonderful. All kinds of other things were coming too, like feelings of being connected to everything. I mean, everything in nature, everything, even pebbles, drops of water in the sea. It was like magic. It was wonderful. And it wasn't like talking about it, which makes it an idea. It was experiential. It was like being inside of a drop of water, being inside of a butterfly's wing, and being inside of a cheetah's eyes. I'm going to skip over this so we have a little bit of time for questions. I know, I know. It's, it's, okay. um, but here, I'll just summarize. So like, people with cancer, we saw like a sub-theme of people like ejecting masses, black clouds from their fingertips, from their body, not just like the idea of cancer, but their fear around cancer. So we had like profoundly physiological expulsion events regarding uh, dread, regarding death and cancer. Um, we had, people saw their family members, like, the psychedelic experience is not about the lone meditator on the mountaintop, and I love the meditation work and studies, but it is not about like that like solo, atomistic individual and like a capitalist, um, like democratic, like lone in individual archetype. It is about people being entrenched, embedded in relational networks. And those networks are not just about people sitting next to you, but like they're deep inside of our understanding of ourselves. And people saw their loved ones consistently on th these journeys. So I'm going to conclude by saying we need to just like reform our methods and our thinking. Our measures should be bottom up, not top down. The MEQ is an edict measure borrowed largely from like Christian and, and Vedanta philosophies and then just exported directly and plonked down into the psychedelic discourse. You need to build new measures and build new therapies around this particular work. So let's get inside the black box. You can join me in there later if you'd like. Um, um, but I think it's time to open up that black box. Like, the black is just a type of closet, and the closet is structured from both the inside and the outside. Um, and I think that in order as a nerd, right, to like talk about our methods, we need to measure the things that people are talking about. And by measure, I just mean talk with you about it. You know, you can write things down on a piece of paper, but it's like, let's bring it out of the box and into the open. The dark night of the soul, the nature, the theistic experiences, the communications with spirit guides and entities and spiritual awakening. And so I'm going to close there by just bringing back in my call to action. It is so beautiful to see such a huge room of queer people like coming together around something. And for a long time, we like live in the interstices where like as a marginalized queer person or as somebody into psychedelic medicine, you're like far, far. But it's nice to see like the antipodes coming together in this beautiful way. And um, I would love to talk with you now and take a few questions. So if people want to come down, please do um, and continue the conversation. I believe that like queering psychedelics, like the psychedelics are already queer, it's just time to speak truth to power and to reform at every level the way that we think about our work, our practice, and our spiritual journeys. So thank you very much.
So uh, thank you for this amazing presentation and um, would love to get, if you have a business card, um, but <laughs> I think a lot of us would. Um, so a lot of studies come out and about how like um, physical touch and interconnected with other human beings is like really important to mental health and trauma recovery and stuff. And so as queer folks struggle with desirability and touch even within our own communities, do you feel the usage of psychedelics could help combat loneliness in community and decrease suicide rates by helping us to incorporate touch more with each other? What do you guys think? <laughs> okay. Uh, they, we answered the question. Um, it's a huge question. So, you know, it looks like a quarter to a third of the audience sees patients or clients in your own clinical practices. Like, oftentimes, we are trained in a model where we are not to touch patients. I, I was having lunch with some friends today, and we talked about the, like, bad hug, good therapist. Like, when the client comes in for a hug at the end of, like, the last session, and you're like... You know, like, I, like I, I take some pride in my ability to hug with an embodiment, or like with a sort of like true affection and care for a person in a way that acknowledges their body and my body. But as clinicians, like we're constantly told like touch is complicated and it, it is true, touch is extremely complicated. Um, I do believe that with extensive training, intention, communication, consent with clients in groups that good consensual touch is powerful. And I think that the denial of touch is a type of violence. I think the denial, I think that as human beings, we are, and I, and I realize that this is an extraordinarily difficult topic. And having dealt with psych, sexual trauma and non-consensual touch and the current wave horrifying wave of like sexual misconduct amongst practitioners from all stripes and places. That being said, I believe that some of that is tied to our lack of good touch and ways to, to figure this out. So if you look at attachment theory, it's about like the child being cradled in the parent's arms and whether they can like be among and with and co-regulate and deeply take in a part of the parent into their inner personhood so that they can take that with them and then attach in a loving way with their partners, boyfriends, girlfriends going forward, right? If that's missing or anxious or difficult because the parent couldn't regulate their touch or was too anxious or was neglectful, the person has difficulty with touch and relationships going forward to find what we call a secure attachment. Psychedelics, we know, are powerful change agents. They, you know, by definition, they, like, they manifest the mind. I do believe that there are, is powerful reparative touch work to be done and I would challenge us to think critically about how to implement that in our practices because I think it's missing. Um, the nice thing about this is that much of the psychedelic work, borrowing from like places like holotropic breath work, there are protocols in place, somatic experience to, to not only acknowledge the body but to have good supportive consensual touch with clients when they need to be, they need a handhold, when they need an embrace, when they need a little physical uh, support as well as you know, verbal or intellectualized support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Pincus. I'm a, a Unitarian Universalist minister. Um, I'm aware that a lot of the trauma that LGBT folks carry comes directly from um, religious experiences, experiences in church and with religious professionals. So um, what I'm, I have two questions. The first is, um, you're indirectly referencing um, kind of providing a religious mystical experience for folks as a healing experience. So how have you encountered that in your practice, if it's come up among your patients? Um, and the second is, are you all hiring? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love a UU minister with a sense of humor. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll address the second question in a serious way, maybe the first question in a funny way. So the, the, the funding, like the very first slide here, right, like which is like confronting, um, what is, where is it? Yeah, confronting funding structures, right? Like who's hiring is like driven by what the funding priorities are and he who uh, pays the piper calls the tune, right? So, uh, so, 
so we need to like directly think about that. And you know, I there's a sort of a I mean, I, I hope that we have like space and conversations for that because there are like we're entering a time in the psychedelic landscape where it used to be like low stakes fun, right? Like you go to a Mind States conference in Berkeley in 2001 and like there's all these amazing things happening but like nothing official is happening. There's like no money in it. There's not much like donation going on. And suddenly it's becoming this like massive national, international pharmaceutical drive um, which has potentially major benefits but oftentimes like serious challenges and costs because um, it distorts and perverts incentives for people to do integral work. And unlike the dime where they don't accept money for payment, like we live in a world where we accept money for payment, right? For uh, money for our services, um, uh, or some of us do. Uh, so I don't know who to hire, right? Like, or like who's like what the positions are to be hired. I would love to hire you. Like, we should you should come uh, and offer it where you are um, if you feel called. The, the thing about, and we need to end now, but um, I don't think that these experiences are like dependable mystical experiences. I don't even know what that means exactly. Um, it's not like you like put something in the machine and then it comes out having had a mystical experience. Um, but, um, and I think that has to do with like acknowledging our deep subjectivities. But I think we're gonna end. Um, Bia wants to say something I hear yeah, her say. Yeah, I just um, really want to pay a humble tribute to, to Alex and to Clancy and say that in 2010, when I went to psychedelic science, it was my first trip to California, to the magical world of California, and I saw these two guys, they were hanging out this you know, little flyer saying LGBT meeting in psychedelics. And I was a Brazilian, you know, I thought, what is this Americans doing? They're crazy. What is this? They're going to go, hi, I'm gay, and I like LSD. <laughs> hi, I'm bisexual, and I take masculine. I'm like, what are they doing? And I made so much fun of them. And now, you know, here we are, nine years later. Thank you, guys, for Thank you opening guys. that. Thank you, guys.